Let's take a look now. We're going to finish up our little session together on this little series on handling temptations, unless some new things come up that we have to address, but that's hard to say. But um, I'm wanting to kind of go back to, and I'm going to be using the same questions that I used last week. Gosh, this is our last time for the year. We're going to be taking two weeks off. I'm going to go, and now I'm going to, the next topic is going to be margin. That'll be an interesting one. Physical margin, time, temporal margin, margin in your time, margin in your relationships, margin in your uh, spiritual life. You know, those are, those are very key, key, and most people running and gunning, blowing and going, you know, ducking and diving and plotting and planning. So they don't have any margin. They're always running, running with the engine at full uh, capacity. And so we need to have much more of that. And so I like a lot of the things that Richard Swenson came up with um, on that topic. And so I'll be using that and some other thoughts. But here, going back to where we left off last week, and then I want to tie the threads together, the difference between the flesh and the spirit, we'll, uh, talk about, we've talked about that, but I want to make sure that'll be clear. What does it mean to walk by the spirit as opposed to walking by the flesh? Because this is the key, really, to the spiritual life where we and Christ have an option we didn't have before. Because when Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 8, he tells us very clearly that um, those who are in the flesh cannot be pleasing to God. The mindset in the flesh is death. The mindset in the spirit is life and peace. And you see this contrast between the flesh and the spirit um, in Romans 7 and Galatians 5 and here. He says it doesn't, it's subject, it's not even able to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You don't even have an option of pleasing God. Even your best deeds are tainted. You cannot do it. Only when you now have the spirit inside of you do that, you have that option. That's why he goes on to say, uh, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, and so if he doesn't have a spirit of Christ, God does not belong to him. Or he does not belong to him. But if he's in debt, if he's in you then, there is a possibility that he can do this. Even when your body is dying, still your spirit is keeping you alive and vital. And so in that sense, you're forever young. So we're not under obligation to the flesh to live according to the flesh, because if you do that, it leads to death. But then he, here's the, the transfer. If by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So you are operating in a different source of power than the power of the flesh that we described before. And so this um, idea, this metaphor we've used before between the inner and the outer man is another way of looking at the difference between the flesh and the spirit, where the inner man, the deepest you, then joyfully concurs with the law of God. But we all know and experience the fact that we say things we don't want to say, think things we don't want to think, and do things we don't want to do. We know that. That's painfully obvious. So where did it come from? Remember when I used the example of this one motivator by Paul. He says, I have this ambition. What was his ambition? I have this overarching ambition. And what was it that he said? I make it my ambition to be pleasing to him. You see? Now, again, when you think of the simplicity of that ambition, if I am now playing to an audience of one rather than trying to be pleasing people and impressing people because I can't seek to impress people and be pleasing to Jesus at the same time. I have to choose my audience. So if instead by the Spirit then I'm uh, pursuing Him, and so if I want to be pleasing to Him, then it's easy to know. As soon as you say, is this thought pleasing to him? Is this word pleasing to him? Is this deed pleasing to him? You know the answer. If you just ask the question, you know pretty much because it's a very simple way of analyzing it. So there's a positive narrative here. It's not trying to avoid something, but rather trying to please somebody. Not to avoid something, but to please someone. You see the difference there? And so it's about a person, it's about a relationship. And in that respect, then, it's very Trinitarian. And the more I do thinking about the living God, the more Trinitarian I have become and for various reasons. And I, because it's always about the dynamic of these uh, personalities that are meshing together and moving 
in a, a, a wonderful synergy. And he gives us examples on earth, even uh, so the idea of marriage and, uh, and friendship, these are examples of it. But the, going back to this though, the point is to be pleasing to him, to walk by the flesh, to abide in Christ, to walk by the spirit, all these are the same thing. They're all analogies. So if I remember that threefold uh, thought we had before of uh, in this card, and I constantly refer you back to it because I want you to be, it, I want it to be a part of you. I want you to trust the Father, abide in the Son, walk with the Spirit. That, it's that simple. If you can be doing that throughout the course of the day, that's, I, I have, I would have you where I want you. <laughs> It'd be the way of looking at it. But then there's also these three dimensions, the world, the flesh, the devil. We're familiar with that. Recall these, again, in the spiritual renewal cards, you, you see that the E stands for, what's the E versus the I? External versus internal. You have an internal uh, agency, and that's this flesh, which as we've said before, you can neither improve nor remove. You'll never get rid of it. You'll never clean it up. It'll never be... Uh, some people have better flesh than others, by the way. Some people are just nicer people, but they, still, but they still walk in a fleshly way. Some people's flesh is rather nasty, but some people, they appear to be really nice people. So it's an interesting thing. Uh, so the, but you see, the flesh is this idea of the old self, and so you're no longer a slave to sin, and that's why the idea of reckoning against the flesh, as you recall, was the key theme, so that you re reckon, what does that mean again, I reckon? In the Southernism, I reckon. What does that mean? I regard it to be true, and logizomai is the Greek word used here. It's an accounting term, which means that you're putting it onto that account. You're saying, I'm reckoning this to be true here. So you, in spite of your feelings or your thoughts otherwise, you are choosing to believe that what God told you is true. And so it's, how do I, what's my gut feeling about myself? What's your gut feeling about yourself? Are you buying it? Uh, it'll depend on whether you're getting your script and your, your kind of uh, understanding of life from the world or from the word. And the more we are word-centered and less world-centered, the more you'll have a, a, a biblical view of your true dignity in Christ. Because you are a child of the living God, you're adopted into his family, and we know all these, these truths are there. And so when we talked about the whole idea of our identity, to be a child of God, to be a friend of Jesus, to be not one who is never going to be condemned, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, that you've been set free, he tells you're a new creature, you're holy and, and blameless before God, seated in the heavenly places. These are impressive. That's a pretty impressive list, isn't it? Think about that. Those are riches and wealth untold, beyond what the world could ever imagine. I look at the lives of, of great uh, industrialists who were very wealthy, when you think about, especially at the turn of the previous century, and when you think of, of Morgan and Rockefeller and Astor and all these other families. And what did you discover in every one of those instances, whenever you looked at them? Uh, the Vanderbilts and so forth. What did you discover they all had in common? It was never enough. How much is enough? Another dollar more. It was never enough. Because even they, they who acquired so much knew it's just not all it's cracked up to be. Any more than fame is what it's cracked. People want to be famous, but then they get miserable when they become famous. Because then they have these fawning sycophants and everybody trying to get their attention and so forth. It's not a pretty thing. So fame and wealth and power aren't all they're cracked up to be. The flesh tells us otherwise, though. Says, oh yeah, it's maybe you, but let, I'd rather be, let, let me have that, that problem of wealth. You see? So we don't really believe it. But I'm suggesting here that instead, when we go further and understand, your true dignity is if you reckon yourself to be the person God claims you, calls you to be, then only there do you have true, the three things, security, significance, satisfaction. Remember those basic S needs that we all have. We all need the unconditional love and acceptance, which is what security is. But you're not gonna find it from people. You'll let them down and they'll let you down. You'll only find it true security from the one who loved you in spite of yourself, 
So the one who knows you and the one who loves you most is the one who actually knows you best. And that's the amazing thing. There's nowhere you can hide. It's funny how we do this with our prayers. We try to get really very pious in our prayers and so forth. He's not that stupid. He can see through those kinds of things, those deceptions, these barriers. We may trick each other, but he is after the heart. Give me your heart, my son, and let your, let your heart, your eyes delight in my ways. In other words, I want you. I don't want your attributes or things. I want you. And in spite of the fact that we seem so unlovable and were, in Christ, he creates us, makes us new creatures in our deepest self. And as a result, we become people who are now uniquely expressing the glory of God insofar as we walk in the Spirit. Now, the problem is we always have an option. Throughout the course of this day, in this day, you will be constantly pulled by the flesh to be pulled downward. So renew is against the world, the external system, which provides opportunities now as never before. And against the devil, resist, because there is a spiritual warfare. But the flesh is different from those two. It's an internal thing that the world and the devil will try to use as an appetite. So given that notion, then let's go back to where we were with uh, this material here and take a look. So here's a pre preventive medicine, these, these thoughts these for when I have temptations. So I, if I use a biblical pattern of thought when the warfare is intense, just as judo leverages the force of an opponent to one's advantage, so these affirmations can convert the force of temptation into a positive spiritual reminder. So in one way, you're actually better off having been tempted if you approach it correctly because it's a reminder to go back to where you need to be, you see? So it, you can you leverage the force of the enemy to your own gain when you actually use it as a reminder to go back. And that's where training comes in because the more you train, the more you ha habituate, the more spring-loaded you become toward being that kind of, beha that kind of behavior and it's then more uh, characteristic. Well, I've already told you my four areas of, of, of difficulty, uh, and I know this is very theoretical for most of you men, but I'll let you imagine what it might be like to have a temptation to anger or a temptation to seek revenge. Uh, I know it's very theoretical, or sexual temptation, maybe one or two of you have this issue, and then um, temptation to covet. Now, everybody, as I say, has a unique flesh signature. No two of us have precisely the same combination of flesh. And that's why I say some people's signature is more acceptable than others. Some have more addictive signatures. So they have addictive behaviors in their lives. And so it might be gambling, it might be drinking, and may anything of excess. So their flesh may be more vulnerable to, to that. So given that, you need to be brutally honest about yourself because if you're not, then you will be able, you will deceive yourself. So you don't have to say, I have to cover it up because that's not who you are. Who are you in Christ Jesus? Going back to this little chart then, here's, this is who you are, your deepest self. But that outer will not go away, nor will it ever go away in this life. When and where, I've told you before, when it's going to be stripped off, the judgment seat, the beam of Christ, that's when it'll be removed. We can't do it, but, but he will. So if we come to embrace by faith that this is indeed who we are and that we are truly seated with him in the heavenly places, we have powerful resources. But therefore, I can honestly tell you my flesh pattern is this because it's not the deepest me. You see the concept there? You can be brutally honest about it, but you need to have people who will ask you good questions. And that's why I said before, accountability is so important because I have to have somebody with, I, if I have any secrets at all, if there's, if there's something I'm doing and nobody knows about, that's a danger area. So I have to trust somebody. There's a risk involved in this because you're telling them something that you, they could use, but obviously it's a matter of trust. But I have people that I trust, and then remember, accountability must be invited, you see. And it must be not the illusion, but the real thing. It's only good as, as good as the information upon which it's based. So I must invite that person 
I'm, you know, this is an area for me. Would you ask me questions from time to time? See how I'm doing. And that's, then you know they're going to ask you that kind of question. That's a very good thing. So this is sin. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now, I never go through this whole process when I'm, when I'm in the t- temptation. This is the process of thought that relates to this, but my summary is in one word. But the anger of man doesn't achieve it. Um, there, is, uh, there, is a, there is a righteous anger, but most people don't actually practice that very well. I do not want to sin because it's beneath the dignity of the person I've become in Christ Jesus. You don't want to. That's not who you are. I don't have to either. That's the beauty of this. Because he's now, no, I'm not under the power of sin. I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus. I have to regard that as true. So if that's true, if this is sin, and if sin is beneath my dignity, and I don't want to do it because of that, and instead I don't have to, then why am I tempted to get angry? So in this case, in my, in my case, it's usually because I've embraced the kind of wrong thinking where I've committed myself to unrealistic, unrealistic plans. I want to get to from there, here to there in a certain time. And if I'm not careful, I'll make my joy dependent upon it. You see, about some artificial outcome that I, of my own invention that I can't control. And yet, if I'm not careful, any obstacle, you see, can make you bummed out because you had this flat tire, you need to get to that plane or whatever, you name it, any number. This traffic, you didn't expect that traffic or there's an accident, any number. Now you have a choice. You can either fume and, and, and just get bummed out again more and just amplify that, or you can say, Lord, you allowed this in my life, and I'm going to look to you. And the outcome I can't control, I always knew I couldn't. But now I'm going to modify. And again, it's the thing I showed you before that's become very meaningful to me. It's this idea of adapting my calendar time, my chronos, to what? His opportunity time. So by really dying to my agenda, and, uh, and really inviting his, then I'm living in a way that I'm tra- transferring, uh, transferring Kronos to Kairos. And I can't put that on my calendar. That's why I call it Kairotic. I made up a term, living Kairotically, where I t- turn my Kairo- Kronos, my time, into his and submit that. I have to do that a lot. There's a lot of, a lot of, because life is full of unexpected things all kinds of things. Your plans, even if all your meetings make, it'll still be hundreds of things that'll happen this day that you could not have put in your planner, the little details and nuances even within those times. So here then, I um, may commit myself to catching a flight, as I say. It's not in the desire to get to the meeting on time, but making my sense of well-being dependent upon it. That's the mistake. So insofar as depression is anger turned inward, these affirmations are relevant for depression as well. So some turn their anger inward, some more outward. So there's a bit, bit of difference as well. But at least I have to be brutally honest with my, myself. And so then the correct way to think is to remember that God's in control and has my best interests at heart. That's always a critical uh, affirmation of those two truths. He's in control. And he wants what's best for me, even though I may not perceive it as my best. Then my response is to trust in the Lord and not lean on my own understanding. And since that's true, then God must have intentions that I can't presently grasp. So what's my final thing? I will walk, I choose to walk by the Spirit, not carry out the desire of the flesh. And what's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the life of Christ. Now, the same process you'll see is followed with the others. So it doesn't, we don't have to drill down as much. But again, this is sin. And specifically, seeking revenge, which is a typical thing, where I become a, a vigilante on the highway or something like that. I want to correct everyone's wrongs. You see, that's sort of a, whatever it happens to be. Uh, um, that's a stupid thing. But you see... He, what the scriptures say is, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved. See, let leave room for the for God to, to take care of that. So I don't need to pay back evil, and frankly, I don't want to to sin again. The same principle I used before. It's not who I am. 
I don't have to, same principle. Why am I tempted? Well, in this case, I want justice, perhaps, and there are many ver variations. As uh, someone cutting me off in traffic or as deep-seated as harboring a resentment against another person for years and people have just nursed grudges and grievances. And I know people who it's almost like they symbolically put it in a kind of a box. And every so often where they want to, when they're feeling bad, they want to have a pity party. So they'll take the, open up the box and fondle that resentment and that, that injury because you see, that's an objective thing that I can see I was wrong, you see. And then they base their identity on that and they put it back for future use when they want to throw another pity party. That's not a healthy way of living. Here's what happened though. God gave me better than I deserve. He didn't give me justice. Thank God for that. Instead, he gave you mercy, not giving you what you deserve, and grace getting better than you deserve, and therefore, because I've been forgiven, what? I'll forgive others then as well, and treat them with mercy and grace, you see, and then I will walk by the Spirit, so I end up the same way. Does that make sense? You see, there's a logic to this. I'm not saying I think it through every time I'm tempted, but there's a, this is my logic that uh, I, I, I want to compress. Okay, sexual temptation. Here's the one I use here. There's no future in this. Men never fantasize about getting caught. You see, they only think about the pleasures of the thing, but never its consequences. But as you well know, the consequences are far greater, uh, greater pain than, than, than the pain of, of, of resisting. So it would damage my relationship with God. It would, could destroy my relationship with my spouse and children, as well as damage my relationship and discredit my ministry in this, in this area. There's not a future in it. Where is this, where is this gonna go? Remember who did that well? Who thought it through in advance when he, was, when he knew he was gonna be constantly tempted by this woman again? She wouldn't let up. Potiphar's wife, remember that? Joseph. And he said, this would be against God, be against your, against your, your, your husband, you know, my, my, who is my, uh, I'm, I'm his steward. It's not right. And so remember then he leaves because of that and she grabs his garment and then, said, then turns it around and says he's the one who tried to rape her and so forth. So it's, then you have injustice going on and then you could get bitter with God. So it would be another temptation, you see, but here. Um, I'm not gonna degrade this person, but we'll treat her or him with dignity and honor. I will treat her or him as a subject, not an object, is a key theme. And I'll let the attractiveness that may be there direct me to praise for the greatness of the creator. So I can leverage that. So the, the glory of this person really is a reflection of the glory of God. And so I can see this person as a, one who is to be treated as a subject, not an object. And so, again, um, redirect the, in, the incoming force, then, from temptation to praise when you do it that way. I'm no longer under the power of sin, once again, we say the same principle, and I, I'll walk by the Spirit, and I'll fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter. And then finally, and this is, again, all in the warfare spirituality facet of conform to his image, all right, covet. That's my fourth main area. And this is sin. I don't want to, I don't have to. I'm going to be content, and here's the thing. If I'm not content, then I'm going to be coveting. It's going to be something, and how do I look at my well-being? Is it going to be allowing Jesus to set that standard, or am I going to be putting my eyes on other people? And then comparisons and a loser's game, because there'll always be someone who has more. Or even if you have more than they do, then you become arrogant, so it never works. So he, we go on to say, stop comparing with other people, There'll always be people who have better whatever it is than me. Uh, instead, I take my eyes off other people's possessions and fix my eyes on Jesus, and then I'm content and thankful. And then this is something we added in the revised edition that wasn't there before, the four Gs. The, these were not there, so we added them in this edition. Uh, gratitude, I can't be angry and grateful at the same time. Grace, I was given grace, not justice. Glory. Um, others are not object, but image bearers and goodness. He gives me what he knows I need. And so when I look at it from that standpoint, then I, I see then this is my one word response. Now it happens, you know, I like alliteration. I, I didn't have to force these. It just the G's worked. 
And so, because gratitude, I can't be grateful, angry and grateful at the same time. Can you? How can you be grateful and angry at the same time? So you have to choose your perceptive mode. How do I perceive this? And then revenge, the simple word grace. If I, if I train myself to summon it up, now I know the content behind it. I've thought it through. You see the, the logic that I went through, but I, I don't have time when I'm tempted to, I, this is sin, this is, I don't have to do this. No, I, but the one word you train, and then it summons it up, ah, so I can choose grace, give them better than they deserve, because I was given better than I deserve. You, does that make sense to you? And then sexual, glory, not only the glory of, of the person, but the glory of God who made that person. And then finally, coveting, because God is good and he's given me what he knows I need. He doesn't give me my greeds, he gives me my needs. And so uh, another way of looking at this then is this. So, so here, uh, the, the backwards now, so gratitude, grace, glory, and goodness. And I find this works very help. It's very helpful uh, and uh, effective to the degree th to which I train myself uh, to do that. So because we have these besetting sins, uh, we're better prepared to respond to temptations. Um, and then there's, of course, the old seven time-honored list of the seven deadly sins and so forth. But what you really have here is... Um, the uh, areas, in fact, the seven sins. Um, it's not a bad diagnostic tool when you think of pride, envy, anger, sloth, greed, and gluttony, and lust. It's a pretty, pretty big list there. And pride with its self-inflation and debasement of others, personal ambition and presumption and vanity, cardinal sin, all the others are variations of it. So at the end, it always comes down to me, what about me? So it's the egocentric world rather than the Christocentric world. It comes, that's, it, there's a simplicity in that respect. Who's in the center of my life? So the prayerful pursuit of humility then is, and the asking the grace of God to humble myself before under his mighty hand that I, I will, so that I will receive grace and mercy. So and a growing awareness that apart from him, what, what am I? I am nothing, I have nothing. So there is a wonderful way of seeing and thinking, I think, that we have to say. Everything comes from him and through him and to him. And when I think of that, 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 ter that terrific image there in Romans eleven thirty six, everything is that way. And so Proverbs 3, 7 is also apropos. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So when we think about um, this whole idea of Proverbs 3, trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So with all your heart, trust him entirely. Do not lean on your own understanding, trust him exclusively. And then in all your ways, extensively, you see, acknowledge him. And then he will guide you, he will give you that wisdom that you need. So I think about that as a, another component here of this Proverbs, that I look at this, don't be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil, which brings me back to these questions that we started with here. And so the difference between the flesh and the spirit then, you can see we're talking about an inward power of sin. The old scripts, the old lies were not erased. They will never be, you'll never improve this. That'll be taken care of when we stand before him. So we have this inner, um, it's this pull, but it's not the deepest you. The deepest you is now seated with him in the heavenly places. And so that's the important distinction there. We have a choice we didn't have before. You have more options as a believer than you did as an unbeliever. You can please God. You could never have done that before. And that's an amazing thought, you see, that you can do such a thing. Then how do we walk by the Spirit? And think about this whole idea. Remember the idea of walking by the Spirit is keeping in step with the Spirit. So you don't go ahead, you don't lag behind. My tendency is to go ahead. I see a thing in advance, I want it, and I think that's good. And then I try to run ahead of God, and then I get impatient and so forth. So I have to 
modify, wait, wait, you're jumping, run ahead, okay, come on back with me. You're jumping and running ahead. Some people lag behind. So some people in their fleshly nature might happen to then not keep up. You see, they're not really paying attention. The best thing is to walk in, 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 and invite the Spirit then to guide you. So it's a, a, an ongoing walk together. And then how will you use these personal affirmations for handling temptation? And if you, what you first want you to do is to write out your own flesh signature, because it's not the deepest you, but we all have it, a signature. And for some, it'll be addictive behaviors. For some, it'll be another area. Like C.S. Lewis, Gambling was never a pull for me. I don't know why, but I don't want to say that I, it's never going to happen. You see, let him who thinks he stands beware lest he fall. Don't want to be arrogant about that. But I've never been tempted to do that. I've been in three casinos so far, and all, place, all, all of them I never gave them a nickel. But I did what I actually did was watch the Greed Festival, um, as, and, and, and no clocks, no external uh, daylight, um, horrible noises, lights everywhere. It was like bedlam, chaos, hell. To work. And so I'd come up to people and watch them and ask them, are they enjoying themselves? So I did a sociological study in those three places because I, it, it was fast. So I actually asked them questions because one's working this thing and working that one. So no sooner do they pu pu put their money in this than they're going to the one next to it. This is, I've seen factory worker jobs better than that. You see, it's like factory. You're like, at a, you're, it's industrial. And how much are they gaining? Just enough that they give you enough of reward to keep the suckers there because everything's against you and you know it. They're not in a charity business. The more, you, the more time you spend, the more likely it'll be that the odds will be as they already have them. So why then do we do this, you see? So it's an amazing thing. So, but I have other areas. So you have to ask yourself, Come with a list of your own areas, number one, and then come up with your own words, single words, and that's where I'm going to leave you. So, for this our little session now, what insight, what idea that came up at one of your tables? Anything specific? Usually, there's a great wisdom coming up here. Did any of you try um, coming up with your own little list of things? Yes. One of the things that I hadn't heard yet that came up from that way two years ago was the one verse that uh, we memorized that was very helpful in all these circumstances was 1 Corinthians 10 13. Yes, I mean, let's look up 10. He's talking about 1 Corinthians 10 13, and it's well worth a quick look at that so that we can see. No temptation has overtaken you. But such as is common to man, this is not unique. You're not the only one, in other words. You, others are in the same struggle as you are. That's good to know that. But then he brings us back, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. Now, that's a strange thought. Um, but with the temptation provides the way of escape so you may be able to endure it. How did you process that? When you... The first thing was that uh, when you memorize it, and something comes up, a temptation, you're often not in a place where you go, time out, I need to go look at this up. Uh, yeah. That's my <laughs> top of mind, so that when something comes up and I say that, that's usually enough to look at it and go, what would God want me to do here? Yes. So to repeat, for those who may not have heard, he's saying, when you've memorized this, it serves you far better than if you just have a vague idea of this. And so it's those texts of scripture that you've memorized will serve you best at, at the point of need, rather than the things that you know are there, but something nebulous is there. I know there's a verse about this somewhere, one might say. That's not strong enough. So that's why there are certain verses like that you need to know about. But to know that and then to apply it and then to train yourself to have a kind of a habituated mind where you think about that and process it correctly. Again, a lot of people are going through the same thing. Nothing's unique to you, it's, it's common to man, but how do you approach this? And how do you actually allow your own narrative to be defined more and more by God's truth, God, God's word, God's narrative, and less and less by the world's narrative, certainly less and less by the, the narrative of the flesh and all of that. What other thoughts did you, yes? 
What's the difference between the temptations of the flesh and the temptations of Satan? Should I fear? <laughs> and I like that. And what's the difference between the temptations of the flesh and the temptations of Satan? I like the ad- last part you added. And should I care? <laughs> That's great. That's very good. Um, I think you should care, I guess. But the, diff- the one is internal, remember. So the interior, the flesh. One difference is that. Um, because if you didn't have this flesh, frankly, Satan and his demons wouldn't have much to get work with, you see. And so what I think the difference is, is that the devil amplifies anything the flesh allows. So if you give the flesh anything to work with, it's looking for something. Suppose you starve the flesh by not feeding it, you see, after a while, my word, it's looking for something. And so that's where if you give the second look, it can suck up all kinds of information in a fraction of a second. It's all, I need something to work with. And then, the, then now you've given the devil an opportunity insofar as demonic agencies are legalists, as I've said before, you've given them a right to actually have a, 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 a place. You've given, you've given them a beach hold because you have not repented of that area. You're still practicing it. They have a right, therefore, and that's part of the thing that's, that's different, is that there's an external force other than you now that's amplifying that interior pull. And it's providing opportunities and amplifying it and so forth. And the more you give it then that stronghold, you see, or a beach hold, then if you unabated, it can begin to grow, you see. And remember that you can rationalize more and more. Because each, each thing you submit to, everything you succumb to, makes the next one possible. So that it's a gradual decline. So that the beach hole becomes a stronghold if you, don't, if you keep on going. And then what happens with a stronghold? My metaphor, it becomes a stranglehold, you see. It, or another way of looking at Satan and the angels, it could be the daimonizomai, the, the idea of, of to be demon-possessed, actually means to be demonized. But there are different degrees of demonization. Um, and one of the, so it would be helpful to see this because, um, let, me just, uh, let me just create a new picture here. Um, one way of seeing this would be, so you can have, you know, the, in, there can be influence And then there can be um, a, a kind of a harassment, you see. That, so there can be um, uh, more than that. It can be a, a kind of like a, um, a harassment and then a co- control. And when it, then control. And so when I go back to, in fact, one way of looking at this is in this book, when I, got, when I went into uh, The Devil and His Angels then, I, I spoke a, a lot about that and described those distinctions uh, that one can have, the, the degrees of demonic activity, you see, and then deliverance from that, and so and causes of it. But, uh, and what are the sim- symptoms of it? I'm trying to find, yes. Um, so one is influence, harassment, or I called it oppression here, you see. So it can grow the very same thing. It can oppress you. And then the third one, is control. See, there's a de- different degrees to which it can get you. So the more t- ground you yield, the more they'll take, because they have a right. So the way that you get rid of this in part is repentance, because if you do not repent of a thing, if you do not, which means to change your whole way of seeing and looking and, and turn your direction away from that and to him and realizing that's, that's calling it what it is. Then you're giving them back that territory, and, you're, and as a result, they no longer have that right. And so you're diminishing. That's why renew, re- reckon, and resist are all three necessary, because you are in a milieu in which you have these two forces that will never go away in this life. But thank God, in the, in the, in the age to come, they will be removed. Think of what it will be like in a tearless, deathless, painless, world that he's bringing about.
where he makes all things new. Think about that context where there'll be no world system pulling you down, no flesh because it's been dealt with at the judgment seat, no devil because they've been confined. Think and now add to that you're in a glorified resurrected body that has great capacity, far beyond what you have. Then add to that, you are in a, in a resurrected creation, a new order of physics that will be, instead of being recalcitrant, it will now be like a garden that will cooperate. Think about what that'll be like as you, as an agent of the king, are going to be creating things and the possibilities are boundless. I like to think about that because it's pretty exciting. It'd be more than worth all that we go through in this world.